And oh, yeah. To Ben Fletcher. Right, well, good morning. Um, I'm Ben Fletcher. And I've also got a sign name in BSL, which is the sign for hoodie. <laughs> well, I'm a techie. What do you expect? <laughs> so I'm here to talk about access all areas. And no, don't worry. I'm not going to be talking about a backstage pass to Cliff Richard. No, no, no. I'm actually talking about what access really means. And really, the more honest description is equal power and equal participation. So when you hear the word access, what comes to mind? Quite often, it's a, a burly bouncer at a nightclub saying, hang on a minute, is your name on the guest list? Ben, no, you're not on the guest list. Sorry, you can't come in. And that creates two groups, the in-group and the out-group. And disabled people are always in the out-group. And we're left outside in the cold, dancing on the street. <laughs> Just like these two. So what am I going to speak about today? I'm going to be telling you um, a whistle-stop tour of my own life, my experience of access and my relationship with accessibility. And then we're going to have a look at when access fails and why access fails. I'll be telling a few home truths and really just to discover what does work and who benefits when access works. And really that is, the answer to that is everybody benefits. It's not just people with disabilities, but whether it's to do with products and services, consultation, the community and networking, whether that's physical or spiritual, everybody benefits in all those areas. And then I'd like to tell you about my dream world, what I would imagine the world to be. And I'll give you some tips about how to make your world accessible. And if there is enough time at the end, I'm going to teach you a couple of signs. <laughs> so this brings me on to this. <laughs> no, no, this is not real sign language. <laughs> This is not BSL. Do not use this unless you want to embarrass yourself. <laughs> so on to me, 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 my life, my life story. So I was born in Denby Dale, also called the Pie Village. It's true. And that is because one, once upon a time, someone made a ginormous pie. I kid you not. <laughs> And I was the only deaf in the village. <laughs> so my parents quickly caught on to the fact I was deaf. I'd be peacefully sleeping whilst they hurried around, banging pots and pans to see if I would respond. And so my parents set about asking for advice and help. What do we do? How do we communicate with our child? And the official was, advice was, just treat him like any other hearing child. Speak to him. So my parents thought, well, we'll, we'll try. <coughs> this did not work. <laughs> it was awful. Most of my speech therapy consisted of me blowing raspberries on a balloon. It was slow, it was painful. Language development was a painful experience and it made me lose a lot of confidence as a child. My language didn't develop. I really plateaued. My parents knew something was wrong and they set about searching for something else, something better. Good boy, good boy. 
And on their search, they stumbled across the deaf community, a community that has its own language, its own identity, its own culture. And as a small boy, my eyes opened to the world and I could engage. I could feel the sense of confidence just rise in my being. And I was able to immerse myself in a world where language exist, existed. So I then later shot to fame. My parents wrote a book about me. And this is available at Amazon for a pound. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. This is about the story of my life and finding sign. But at the age of 11, I had quite a, a serious incident that I was hit by a cricket ball on the head. And I quite rapidly lost my vision. So I was already deaf. I lost all the vision in one eye and was increasingly losing vision in my left eye. It was incredibly hard. So I'd like you to try stepping into my shoes. These are my shoes. <laughs> very thin, barefoot, vivo shoes, specialist shoes. I've got them on now. Very bendy. And the thin sole is designed to help you feel every bump in the road. Quite a lot of deaf people have, um, have their balance affected. So these allow you to really grip onto the pavement that you're on. So uh, I went through my teenage years, went through my GCSEs, A-levels with the help of my parents, and I even managed to get an interview at Cambridge University. I walked into my university, uh, the university room where I was having my interview, and the professor had no patience. He was playing a maths game, speaking through the, the interview at the same time, not looking at me, and I was expected to go through this interview to get a, a maths um, degree placement, and my, my interpreter was rubbish at maths. So, <laughs> needless to say, I didn't get in. But I thought, sod it. A Yorkshire boy at heart, I'll try York University. And the accessibility provisions there were incredible. I was able to participate in a computer science degree, and I was typing like the clappers. <laughs> using my hands an awful lot with, um, with typing. And quite quickly I developed something called RSI, repetitive strain injury. So that was my third disability, which made things really difficult. But I struggled through, but I got my first degree, my first, um, and became a master innovator at IBM, who offered me a, a position following my graduation. And then, now that brings me to today, here at Monkey Gras Conference, which is, OMG, pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did I get here? I think these, um, the access has obviously been important, but also these grey fellas. <laughs> you might be able to spot them if you look closely. Wisdom and a bit of age. So I'm now working at the Financial Times. I'm the principal engineer, managing 40 people, which is quite incredible. So that's my life story. So I want to take a little look about access and when access fails. I've got a few examples. The last one was Christmas Day. So on Christmas Day, I was invited to my hearing girlfriend's house, family's house, 
for Christmas dinner and her family were all hearing. So everybody was talking as they generally do at Christmas Day, but I wasn't able to access the conversation and there was no interpreter, which made things really difficult. Last year, my life changed. I became a father for the first time. So I was really excited when I went to the hospital to go and see the first stenograph of my baby. We walked into the room and they turned the lights off. So I wasn't able to see. So I asked the interpreter, can we do hands-on interpreting? And the interpreter said, I'm really sorry, but I don't know how to do that. So I missed all the information around my first child's stenograph. I also stood for Parliament. I was the first deaf-blind person to stand for Parliament. And it wasn't a road without barriers. It was probably the worst experience for barriers. And it's actually become even more increasingly difficult because the, the funds to access office has actually been taken away. So disabled people can no longer get supported to stand for Parliament. So why does access fail? I've thought a lot about this and can surmise in a one lovely keynote slide. So the first one would be people haven't had any training or haven't had an, an awareness and it's their first time in dealing with access needs. Lots of people wouldn't know where to start. Quite often I'm asked if I can bring my own interpreter. I don't have a holographic interpreter who's there 24-7 with me. I can just ping up whenever I need, unfortunately. It might be down to people not planning. Accessibility planning line is just not in people's schedules. Or maybe it's a budget thing. The person who does the budgeting hasn't budgeted for access. And I know the government have wanted to save money, so they've actually scrapped a lot of access funding for disabled people. So it creates a very negative view of disabled people in society, which has been really damaging. The government do provide some support for deaf and disabled people in the workplace and also in education. But there are so many other loops, loopholes where there are, there are no funding. There is no funding for access in, in so many other areas of life. And we have to campaign, fight, plead to get access. So onto my home truths. At the top of this list is power. Power is a big problem. And this is because lots of the decision makers who are making decisions about disabled people's access aren't in the position of experience. There are no deaf, and deaf people in Parliament. So we are reliant on people's goodwill in order to provide services and policies for us, which leaves us in a position of having to plead and beg. <laughs> <laughs> the Equality Equality Act is the only piece of legislation there for us and it's full of loopholes. The term reasonable adjustment doesn't provide us with a concrete solution to make sure we are included in society. So if the government can't provide for us and we can't rely on them, then we rely on actually everybody in this room. The government likes to think in the, U in the UK that everybody's needs are the same. That's the picture on the left hand side. That's their view of equality. 
but really it puts people at a real disadvantage. If we have a look at the picture on the right hand side, we've got reality where people aren't at an equal point. But what we really need to do is get to the middle picture, equity, where people are provided for based on their need. So I've been ploughing through all the negatives, I know, but I am slowly going to bring over the positives, which is the good bit. <coughs> so what's most important to change this? Number one, people's attitudes, your attitudes, and how you can go from a small group to a really influential group and influence lots of others. I'm going to show you a short video and this is a video that was made at my workplace in the Financial Times. Oh, I think we need some help. There we go. Okay, three, two, one. Happy birthday, Ben. Happy birthday, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic example of my work colleagues all wanting me to feel included <laughs> learning my language it's just marvellous so the other thing that attitude links to is culture we all need accessibility champions like Laura. Laura is my work colleague and she has worked with the rest of the team to influence all the hearing people, all my hearing colleagues, to start learning sign language. Just the basics. Hello, how are you? They even do it when I'm not there. <laughs> I come in and they're all signing so it's unbelievable. Everyone's able to have a, a basic level of conversation with me, which is just marvellous. So attitude and culture are linked. You can see how that can then spread. The next thing is tech. Tech also really helps. For many different examples, but I'll just pick one. Uber. Back in the days before Uber, you either had to call, I obviously can't call, for a taxi, or you'd have to hail a taxi, but you'd need to be able to see a taxi coming in order to hail it. So I was really disadvantaged. So Uber transformed my ability to get about. I can call a taxi exactly when I want, where I want, and I'm in control of where I'm going. I don't need to try to struggle to communicate that in the back of a cab. I can just smile, relax, and easily get to my destination. So who benefits? Scope have published some data that says one in five people have a disability. But I think everybody benefits from accessibility and accessible design. One great example is subtitles, captioning. People think, oh, it's only for deaf people, those few deaf people. But no, it benefits so many people second language users of English, children who are learning the spelling of words, people who are hard of hearing, losing their hearing, maybe just anybody in a noisy environment. Maybe you've got your kids and they're running around and it's noisy, or the baby's crying. You could be on the tube and just wanting to watch a programme without the whole tube listening as well. So that's one of my favourite examples. Now, another example that I'm taking from my workplace are meetings. It's very British to interrupt each other during meetings, speak over one another. It's really difficult to know when you can interject. But those grey fellas on my chin have helped me to um, make a stand, make a difference, and implement something different. And actually, I took the example from the Native Americans. 
they had a talking stick that they would hold. Looks a bit like a, a totem pole. But they would pass this stick around and only the person with the stick could talk. At work, we use a ball. <laughs> so whoever's got the ball has the right to talk. And that ball gets passed around. And people find that it, it actually brings a sense of calm. Without the ball, people are panicking, trying to get their sentence out before somebody interrupts them. But there's a real relaxation that comes when you're able to speak freely, knowing that you're not going to be interrupted. So even when I went on paternity leave, they still used the ball in all the meetings because <laughs> they liked it so much. One of my colleagues, a Japanese colleague, emailed me afterwards, after one of the meetings, and she'd, sa she'd said that she was actually in tears because it was the first time since joining the FT that she was able to access the whole meeting. She couldn't understand or follow what, what was happening in meetings, and she's hearing. So it benefits everybody. So, what do you think my dream world is? Is it this? Hello, I like to open a bank account. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. So that's actually just an example of inverted equality, where people still can't access fairly. Really, we want equal access for everybody, so that won't work. The next thing is the sign, international sign for disability or disabled people. Doesn't always work though. I went to the airport, I was gonna fly off to Amsterdam and I said, oh, could I have some assistance please to the person at the counter? And they were on the phone for a little bit, chatting away, gave me the hand signal, the thumbs up, looked like it was gonna be a positive result. So I was like, stood there confidently, twiddling my thumbs. And then suddenly, an assistant came with a wheelchair. <laughs> I was like, a wheelchair? I'm, I'm deaf. I'm, I'm deaf. No, oh, okay. <laughs> so you see, the symbols that we use influence our perspective. And we really need a symbol that's far more broad. And this is what I've designed. <laughs> the rainbow colours signify diversity, the huge range of diversity that accessibility incorporates. And the star is just because everyone's a star. You know, you don't need to be negative in terms of the, the, the symbols. But yeah, it should be positive like this. So, when you go away from today, from my keynote today, I'm going to give you some tips about how you can start impacting your immediate environment. So just like Laura, the accessibility champion at my work, maybe you can ask your organisation, do we have an accessibility champion? And if you don't, then maybe now's your chance. Maybe you could stand to become your accessibility champion at your workplace. Some of you will be involved with planning budgets. So please remember, always plan in an accessibility line in that budget. If you don't use it, if you don't use it, keep, it for the next year. keep it for the next year. <coughs> and share the awareness. For example, at this conference, we've all got Twitter, we've got Facebook. Like what you've seen share it with others and spread the news we will see culture and attitude change through that it's very British isn't it being a bit awkward 
especially about taboo subjects, or oh, somebody with disability, oh, I don't know how I could approach them. Come on, put your brave face on, <laughs> go up, and just say hello, give it a try. The hashtag for accessibility is A11Y. And that's because there's 11 words in accessibility. But actually, the icon looks like ally. So today, I'm asking you to be our allies. Now I've got a little bit of time left to teach you a tiny bit of BSL. This is a sign for access. Access. Everyone try it? Access. And the last sign I'm going to teach you is if you've enjoyed my presentation, don't clap because I won't be able to hear it. <laughs> clap visually so I can see it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and a bit more. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs>